this out. I just spoke before the Nation of Islam in Pasadena. At the lecture, I had just been in Long Beach. Sister came to the lecture and brought this magazine from, she works in the trade industry, it's called Advertising Age. This is the December 16th, 1991 issue of Advertising Age, and it goes to all the PR people, and this is a predominantly white magazine. This is for trade industry people, about contracts and other things. It does not make the mass market. But in it was an ad from Time Magazine to the white advertisers who advertise in it. You remember this cover? You might not see it that clearly. The Browning of America, you remember that cover? Where it said that by 2056, the white man will be a minority? Well, see, they never thought that we'd see this or the niggas that did see it weren't looking or caring, so Time Magazine wrote this in their ad. Come here, bro, you got a good, strong voice. I want you to read this to the people. Read this, what it says right here underneath here on, in the ad. It's in bold black letters, it says, hey, whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. Sometime soon, white Americans will become a distinct minority and largely brown cultural and racially mixed, and racially mixed, a hard story for many of our readers, but time has never tried to be easy. It's what our readers expect. They are willing to pay more for it and spend more time with it, which makes time a perfect place for your clients' messages, comp comprende. Hmm. You hear what time said? Time said, hey, Whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. This is to other white people. Now, I'm telling you that time is thrown up amongst the other whites. We better kick the nigga ass now. A oh, nigga gonna get us. Time is the loose family, skull and bones bred from 1910 on. They was in on the killing of John Kennedy. That's a white thing. Oh, Time Warner. But Warner come in with time. They really two corporations meshed into one. Now, they just had a little fight. One half did the JFK thing, and the other half was covering it up. So you got these corporations merging with competing interests under one house. In fact, the white people are suffering from the Tower of Babel dilemma. Look at them white Zionists and white Anglo-Saxon Protestants fighting it out. I love that shit. I love it when Sununu is fighting the Jewish people and the Jewish people fighting Sununu and Bush and Baker are fighting the is it reallys and the is it reallys fighting Bush and Baker. I like that shit. And you need to go to your white friends that are non-Jewish and say, don't let them Jewish people do that to you. And you go to any, I know you ain't got no Jewish friends, but go to any of them and, and any of them say, hey, don't let them white boys do that to you. And let them get worked up and mad at each other and bite at each other and fight each other. Propagate and magnify anytime you see to your own race of people when whites can't get along because we think they all together and they ain't them greedy bastards can't even sleep with each other right. They can't treat their wife right. Now, in this picture are all black babies except for the last baby is white. Now, they're brown babies, they're black babies, and all those babies are laying there, and one last little baby is white. To tell the white, you'll be the last one on earth if you don't kick some ass now. Now, I'm telling you that in hindsight, those headlines were about building up the energy in the poor white to kill the black if for no other reason than that they could never be the chosen people as long as you're around. Oh, you ain't got to clap for that. That ain't about clapping. Now, let me say this here. God, y'all just left Cincinnati. Need some uh, tissue. This, uh, every time I talk, and y'all heard them tapes, uh, that white supremacy builds up in my nose. <laughs> See, it's healthy. It's clogged up in there. And not till I do good work do it come out. So every time I do good work, I get relieved of the white supremacy that's hidden deep in my head. <laughs> Check. All y'all blow your noses. I'm so much better off for it. Yeah. Y'all better shit at least once a day, too. Because that shit staying you two days, you're in bad shape. That ain't supposed to happen like that. If you lay an apple out and you see it rot, 
If the shit sit in your old belly two, three days, it'd be worse than it looks sitting on the table getting brown. So get that in and get that shit out. Check. Because a revolution got to be healthy. People can't have no two, three day shit sitting in your belly. Don't have no revolution. This is the Cincinnati Enquirer, March 12, 1992. Ex-CIA boss warns of terrorism, social ills. If you check all around the country, they busting into the little welfare thing. Now, they ain't letting 83,000 people off welfare in Michigan and 50,000 in Maryland and 100,000 in Ohio unless they set up the provision to watch all those people when they got taken off the money. So the intelligence community is greater now watching a poor set of our race, unplugging them from the money, preparing to kill them, but containing them and unplugging them in a way to assure, and here's the formula, every time the black people get hurt, Jesse Jackson fly in, he had a march. And he walk them till they tired. He look at them and say, y'all tired yet? They say, yes, we tired. As soon as they good and tired, he fly out and they go home. Every city, check it out, every city, same formula. If it ain't that, then it's sharp, then he come in, he take them down another street. Right, depending on what your flavor is. Now, I, I can like either or the brothers at any given time, but I'm tired of seeing the people ventilated ventilated where the air is let out of their bag, walked into irrelevancy so that there's no harm ever caused to the ones in control. What William Colby is saying at this lecture in Michigan, in, a, in a Cincinnati, is that terrorism is going to come from the poor people who are now socially ill. So as we unplug them from the system, they are the ones who we got to fight since there ain't no more white boys left. And I make a suggestion to you, if you listen to that FEMA tape, that FEMA Western region, about the use of that militia and the cut back into that welfare thing and the anti-crime stuff. In D.C., the little white boy that ran the house bank shot himself in the mouth. Shot himself through his own mouth and the next day the D.C. City Council ruled that a black man arrested could get in jail without being arraigned or offered bail or bond in response to the white boy trying to save his job at the house bank. My point to it is, is that under the guise of fighting crime, some things have creeped up on us. In Washington, D.C., the FBI into the major cities was first done in Washington, D.C. under Sharon Pratt Kelly, who is there because they couldn't trust Marion Barry to do it. So they got her to do it, and when she won the election there, she won the all-white ward, she won the, the rich, mixed, white and black ward and the rich black ward, and she didn't win the other. The only ones voted for her, but in an eight, nine person race, that's all she needed to be mayor. And once she became mayor, she then announced an anti-crime program, and the 14th point of the anti-crime program is to immunize all children by the age of two. Here it is right here. Dixon offers 20 million plan to save trouble, to save the troubled and punish the troublemakers. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, Washington Post, November 27, 1991. The 14th point of her program is immunize every two-year-old in the city. What does an anti-crime program have to do with immunizing a two-year-old child, Africans? Huh? It's some minute. In fact, I don't know if Jack mentioned it, but I hope y'all saw that Rock magazine. That's uh, March, uh, Cincinnati is March 12, 1992, Cincinnati Enquirer. That's the main paper in Cincinnati. Which is, how many of y'all seen this Rock magazine, Rolling Stone? It's a cave magazine. Play rock music in it. Y'all see this issue? The March 19th, 1992 issue. Y'all see that? called the origin of AIDS. Look at that black baby's mouth wide open with that white man's utensil going in that black baby's mouth. Y'all see that? It says the origin of AIDS and it got a bunch of Jewish doctors in here saying no comment, no comment, no comment. I don't know if that polio and smallpox was uh, laced with uh, the AIDS virus. It may have been, I don't check it. You see that black baby? with that mouth open and the hand, and look at this picture here. 
Look at this one white man standing in the middle of all them black people. You might not see that that well. Handing out injections in an all African village. And you need to see this. This is Rolling Stones, March 19th, 1992. And my point to that is, is that somewhere it's an injection thing going on. Now, I like Brother Jack. You know why I like Brother Jack? Because there are not a lot of biochemists and technical medical people who broke away from the white man and came back to us and spoke to us in any form or any fashion. I love you, Jack. Where you at, Brother Jack? You in here? Where you at, Brother Jack? Yeah, brother, let's give Judge Jack another hand. Because you see, he needs to have a laboratory and we need to pay for it. We do, it needs to happen. Look at the Magic Johnson situation. I want to tell you for a fact, and Brother Jack, I, I say this, I state this publicly, that when they announced that Magic Johnson had a virus that brings on AIDS, that there were at least five or 10,000 black people that day that were so depressed and so hurt that they lost the will to fight the virus and the virus got their ass in the depression. You see, your mind has a lot to do about the willingness of your body to let a virus penetrate the living parts of your cell. And so when you announce a $25 million a year black man is on AZT, which kills all of your cells, not just the bad part, it kills the good part too. That's controlled death. Now, if you got a black man with 25 million in his pocket, can fly anywhere on the planet to get a remedy, and you got a nigga to stand up and say, I got it, I quit, I'm on AZT, you got you a real fool. But, but, everywhere in the country, when it was announced that Magic had this virus, everybody called everybody to see if somebody could get to him and give him some Kimron or Emirex. Everybody, all over, how many calls I had, how many times we tried to trap this nigga. You see, before he had the problem, in LA you could find him at the basketball court in the community, he was readily accessible to everyone. But as soon as they announced he had it, you couldn't find him. But them Jewish boys was out speaking for him. And they give him the shit remedy that'll kill him and the whites do not want him to announce, I'm doing fine, I'm on the black thing. What would it do to what he has planned if he got well on the black thing and everybody know his name? Let me tell you, in Washington, D.C., we know he got it. The brothers caught him, Dr. Aleem's aide, caught him in Washington, D.C., and put the camera on in his hand. A couple of days later, he announced to the whites that he wanted to come back. The whites said, no, nigga, we don't want you. And he has said again and again, I want to come back now. And the whites are too far over the line to let him back. A couple of little side bits. A little mysterious in the beginning about how he got it. Didn't come out until after the press conference that it was heterosexual, but the prostitute that they alleged gave it to him, who was fingered in the media in LA, took the test and didn't have it. And she got in them little uh, stars and inquires and said, don't stop doing business with me. I ain't got the shit. She said, y'all ain't fucking up my business. And if she didn't give it to him, where did he get it? And why was he having all those tests and it never showed up? And what is it about this moment in life before you attack the black people that you bust down their heroes? Y'all ever remember that movie Rollerball? When Jonathan got too big for the game and he really wasn't waking nobody up, 
but all of the people liked him and it made the white man vulnerable to an extraordinary personality that only played sports. But the white boys called him in and said, Jonathan, you have to announce your retirement. And Jonathan said, what the fuck? I'm at the height of my game. What do you mean? He said, Jonathan, we spent a lot of years getting control of this shit. We're not going to let no sports hero playing no fucking game ignite and electrify the people and organize against us, even if you don't even understand yet. You're still a danger. In fact, Magic, you're somewhat charismatic. Michael, you're somewhat charismatic. Mike, yeah, you got an overactive sex appetite, but the little street people love you, Mike, and we don't like that right now. We're about to kill the black people. No heroes allowed. Check. <laughs>